Hey everyone, so in this video, we're going to be taking a look at setting up pod security policies in Kubernetes. I find pod security policies to be a little bit challenging to wrap your head around when you're first getting into it, but it is a pretty important thing to consider, especially if you're trying to harden the security of your cluster. Admittedly, I've seen a lot of clusters out there in the wild where this was either turned on incorrectly and caused issues or just not turned on at all because it wasn't quite understood. So the few sections that I'm going to walk through in here are going to be talking about how to set up the admission control, how to set up service accounts so that you can choose who is authorized to make pods in a certain way, the policies themselves that describe the rules available and the available privileges, and then RBACs deciding how you can give certain service accounts the access to those appropriate pods. Now, like always, I'm gonna be going through some different code samples in this video, or really YAML samples around these different topics. And you can find these samples on my website if you wanna follow along in your own cluster as well. The website link will be in the description of this video. Okay, so the first thing that we need to know about pod security policies is that it is an admission controller. Now, admission controllers are basically something in Kubernetes where we have the ability to add something in such that after the auth and authorization oriented pieces like who is asking for it and what group they're associated with, what user they are and so on has occurred, we can go in and ask this admission controller, in this case, pod security policies, whether that particular user should be authorized to do what they're asking to do. I'll start off by SSHing into one of the nodes in my cluster. So this node is on port 22. All right. Great, now this is a pretty simple cluster. It's effectively a kubeadm bootstrapped cluster. Nothing special happening. Calico is a CNI plugin. And I'm actually just running a one master cluster at this point to make it simple. So do note these might be considerations you'll need to take for all of your masters. Now let's start off by taking a quick look at the static manifest. Now, depending on how you install Kubernetes, this could vary, but nowadays a lot of us install the Kube API server inside of a static pod. So basically, for those not familiar with static pods, manifests that we put inside of this manifest directory, directory the kubelet will bootstrap and instantiate on start, such as the Kube API server. So looking inside of the Kube API server for a moment, it's a pod and inside of this pod, we have a couple different flags. Now, in particular, there is an enable admission flag. Now your mileage might vary depending on the version of Kubernetes you're using here. There used to be an old flag, I believe it was just called admission controller or admission controllers. And that flag's biggest difference is that the order mattered. Enable admission, the order does not matter. And it's just like admission control in that it's a comma delimited list. So if I append to the end here, pod security, policy. Now I'm going to have these two admission controllers put in place. It's important to note that just hitting save here in a cluster that you care about is not going to be a trivial change. I'm adding pod security policy here to show you how things work behind the scenes. But suffice to say that once I turn on pod security policy and the fact that I don't have any policies uploaded to my Kubernetes system, Existing pods are not going to be able to be recreated. New pods will not be able to re be created. I'll really kind of lock down my system completely until policies are available. So this is something to consider when you're writing the automation that sets these things up by default in your cluster. But let's start off by going ahead and saving pod security policy just like that. Okay, and I'll exit out of here come back and we are going to take a look at some of the different areas of this cluster as I change deployments around and so forth. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set up a watch on the pod replica set and deployment of the default namespace so that we can keep an eye on this. Now I've just made a change to my API server so it might take a minute for it to bootstrap. There we go. Now if I come back inside of here, I have two deployments that I'm gonna be showing you throughout this video. One is a host network Nginx deployment and one is just a normal Nginx deployment. If we take a quick look at the Nginx deployment, there's really nothing special here. It's a deployment. It runs an Nginx container. That's it. Now, if we take a look at the Nginx host network deployment, the big difference here is this one has host networking set to true. This is going to be our example for enforcing pod security policies. 
This example is actually a pretty relevant one. A lot of times folks will put in a lot of work to do things like set up proper network policies and secure the network. But if you let pods get created that run host networking, then there's a lot of abilities to bypass that and do things from the host level of its network namespace. So that's what we're going to try to lock down first. Now, the first thing that I wanna do here is I want to look at the host network that is, or sorry, the Nginx that is not host network enabled. And we're going to apply this to the cluster. So I'm going to apply the deploy host, uh, sorry, keep saying host network here, but I mean deploy Nginx and send that to the cluster. Now, if we go into the watch here and take a couple seconds to let it update, you can see here that while I'm listing pods, replica sets, and deployments, the only thing that actually got created was a deployment, Nginx deployment, and then the replica set was created as well. But you'll notice the replica set is never going up any counts at all. So this is the key thing. We have pod security policies in place in the actual account that will be instantiating this pod, the replica set account, does not have the ability to create any pods because we have no pod security policies currently in our system. So this is where talking about the idea of service account access is especially important. So I'm gonna come back to our Nginx deployment and I'm going to delete this deployment. All right. Now that that's deleted, it should clean up. And there's one more thing server side I actually wanna give you a quick peek at before I show you some of these different pieces. So if I go into my node one more time and then I run the same command to vim into a manifest, but this time I do the cube controller manager, one of the flags you may wanna make sure is set, although it is the default for a lot of installers and bootstrapping tools today, is that you are setting the use service accounts credentials line. Effectively, what this is going to do is this is going to make sure that there's a separate service account for each controller in the controller manager. And once we get deeper into pod security policies, you'll see how this will enable us to get extremely specific with which controllers we allow access to these policies. As a quick example, if I come in and do a get for service accounts in the namespace cube system, you can actually see a lot of these dedicated service accounts that we're using. So if I wanna make sure that the daemon set controller can access certain pod security policies, but the replica set controller, the one we were just looking at can't, I actually do have the flexibility to do that type of change. All right, so that's some of the pre-work in the system, the admission control and making sure that service account is enabled as well. Now, the next thing that we're gonna do is set up some pod security policies in general. If I come back to these different files here, we're gonna take a look at the policies. Now, in this case, I'm gonna set up a pretty simple policy structure. In fact, a policy structure that might work for a lot of deployments. It's going to contain a restrictive policy, which is effectively gonna be the policy that gets used for everything in the cluster. And then a permissive policy, which is going to be kind of the heightened permissive-like privileges when certain pods should be created, such as ones in cube system. So you can go into the documentation for pod security policies and get an idea for what some of these do. In fact, this restrictive policy is not as hardened as it likely should be. Uh, for example, I'm letting people run as any user and I don't have many restrictions here. But for our example, one of the key things I wanted to turn off is to make sure that not just anybody could create a pod using host networking. So that is set to false. So let's go ahead and create this pod security policy inside of our system. So I will do policy, PSP restrictive. All right, great, so that's created now. Now, I also wanna create the permissive policy as well. Now, very similar, has similar fields. You can just change different values. And in our case, the main focus for simplicity we're looking at here is going to be this host network line, which if anybody can resolve the permissive policy, they're going to be allowed to create a host network enabled pod. All right, so let's go ahead and create that now as well. So this will be the permissive policy. Great. Now just to verify everything's as expected, we can go ahead and do a cube cuddle get one more time, except this time we will do pod security policy and I will get rid of that. Great. So now you can see permissive and restrictive pod security policy and you even get a somewhat of a nice view giving an idea for what privileges are available.
Now, the key thing to note here is I still can't create pods. Just because we have these two pod security policies in place doesn't mean any of my users or accounts can actually access them. So what comes in handy here is the ability to leverage RBAC to set up access to these specific pod security policies so that we can actually create deployments, pods, all that good stuff again. So let's come into RBAC here and take a quick look at this. Now RBAC can be a little bit tricky. Basically, if you remember our use case, what we effectively want to do here is we want to provide a default restrictive policy, and that is going to basically allow every single creation of a pod, whether it be in a cube system namespace or other namespace, to be able to resolve the restrictive policy, which gives us basic access to normal pod creation, but limits things like host networking. And then we want a more permissive policy to be resolved in certain contexts, which could be things like running in cube system and so on. So before we get too deep into how we can set up that kind of escalation like setup, we just need to note that we're going to be creating two cluster roles. Now cluster roles are things that allow that define access to stuff and eventually are bound to through bindings. Cluster roles are completely cluster scoped. They're not attached to a namespace or anything like that. So we're going to start off with a PSP permissive cluster role and then a PSP restrictive cluster role as well. Let's go ahead and apply both of these from our RBAC directory. So I'll do RBAC and I will do the PSP, let's see here, the R, it's prefixed with RBAC. So the RBAC restricted cluster role and then the RBAC permissive cluster role. And make sure we get rid of that typo. Okay. So now we've got the permissive cluster role here that we can bind to, and then we've got the restricted cluster role down here we can bind to, but we obviously need bindings to make these effective in any way, shape, or form. And again, if I didn't call it out explicitly, note that all these cluster roles are doing, they're giving access to the use verb for a pod security policy, namely, in this case, the restrictive one, and that's rep uh, respective to the permissive one up here. Okay, so now we've got these in place. And we need to set up some bindings. Now what I'm gonna do here is take a moment to show you kind of a graphic that gives you an idea of what the logical flow might look like in getting these bindings to resolve certain PSPs. Now in this case, let's say we have a controller creating a pod and the one that we've been using is the replica set controller, but it could be a daemon set controller or anything. And let's say that we had a flow where we were trying to create the cube proxy pod, which actually is something that needs elevated privileges inside of cube system. Now the bindings that we're gonna set up in a moment here, we're gonna start off by setting up a cluster role binding to that restricted policy you see. So if we give the daemon set controller or all controllers access through a cluster role binding to the restricted policy, then those controllers will always be able to resolve the, the restricted policy regardless, or restrictive policy, regardless of where they are operating in. So in this case, the flow would look like us going out for cluster role bindings, pod security policy saying, oh, okay, your cluster role bindings or global policy would be, or policies even, will be restricted policy. And we say, okay. Now, then it's going to ask, do we allow this pod? And in this case, we don't because it's not, it's a host network based pod coming from cube proxy. Going up a step, it's going to retrieve the pod security policies for that particular namespace. And we can achieve this using role bindings. So while I use cluster role bindings to define the global restrictive policy access, I'm gonna use a role binding, which is namespace scoped in cube system to give access to a elevated policy. So it's gonna go out and say, give me pod security policies for cube system. And then it's going to return the permissive policy. In this case, it's going to ask, do I allow the pod? And cube proxy, which requires host networking, is going to say yes in this case. Now, this flow is not meant to represent what Kubernetes is actually doing behind the covers, but it is going to, or behind the hood, it is going to represent what kind of logically you can think about this process as, is you're kind of getting your bearings for how policy is going to be set up from a global and namespace level. So let's go back here and first start off by setting up the global cluster role binding for restricted. Now in this case, 
What we're going to do is something a little bit different than what I was talking about with service accounts. We're going to provide the entire group system service accounts in Kubernetes, the ability to resolve PSP permiss or restrictive, excuse me, such that whether it's a daemon set controller, a replica set controller, whatever it is, they can always resolve that sort of default admission controller. Now note that I'm doing all of this for service accounts for the controllers and things that would actually instantiate pods. Users still would not be able to create pods directly. They'd have to rely on deployments, replica sets, things like that. So if you want your users to be able to create pods, you're probably going to want another group in here that can give users access to this PSP restrictive cluster role. So let's apply this next, and this is gonna be the cluster role binding for restricted. All right, so now we've got the pieces set up such that we should be able to create deployments again. Let's check it out. If we go back to our Nginx deployment, the non-host networking one here, and we apply this deployment again, so I'll apply deployment Nginx, and before I actually hit enter on that, let's set up the watch one more time. All right, so I'll go ahead and deploy that. Coming back to the watch, now you can see it is once again creating, or not once again, but for the first time creating the pod Nginx deployment, which is great. So now the replica set has the ability to create an instance of a pod, in this case, the Nginx deployment. Now we'll make sure that it creates before I leave this point, but just to go back and show you an example of the heightened host network one. What I'm gonna do next is I'm going to remove the old Nginx deployment and bring in this host network one. Now again, since we've only got that cluster role binding in this case, we're only getting the restricted policy back. There's no heightened privileges on a namespace basis. So in short, this one should fail. We can come back, we can see Nginx is running. To keep things clean, let's go ahead and start off by deleting that deployment I just did. So I will delete that, come back to the watch, and now we can see that it's terminating. Now let's go ahead and apply the heightened one. So this will be deploy, and we will do the host network-based Nginx. Create that. And now we're back in the state that we were previously, which is expected. We're trying to create this deployment, this replica set, and it's telling us, no, I'm not able to do this. Let's actually dig in this time and see why it can't do it. So if we grab the name of the deployment or replica set in this case, and we do a cube cuddle describe to that replica set, and we specifically need to call it a replica set, we can actually get some good information from the event API. Namely, you can see, hey, error creating pods, Nginx, forbidden. I wasn't able to validate against any pod security policy. And it even calls out and says, hey, host network was the conflicting value that is not allowed to be used. This is great for troubleshooting. We can tell exactly why this pod was not able to be created. All right. So all is well, let's go ahead and delete that deployment. We're creating pods as we'd expect and protecting our system against pods we don't want. But we still have a problem here. Like I was showing in that diagram with cube proxy, there are some things like cube proxy that we actually want to be able to do these types of things. So when operating inside of the context of the cube system namespace, it's important to us that we can have this extra cluster scoped ability to access the permissive policy. And that's what we'll look at next. So if I jump back to my RBAC, let's now look at the role binding for permissive. I'll open that up. And this role binding, as you can see, is a little bit more specific. So what I'm going to do in this role binding is I'm going to provide this role binding to the namespace cube system. It is going to be available to the job controller, the, actually we don't even need the deployment controller in this case, we need the replica set controller. So let's change that typo. Replica set controller. There we go. Okay, back to it. So the replica set controller, the daemon set controller, and the job controller is all that we need this access to. So let's go ahead and apply this for PSP permissive cluster role access. So we will apply, in this case, it's going to be in my RBAC directory, and it is going to be the role binding. So let's find that and add permissive in. All right. Now, if we bring this watch back up one more time, 
I should still not be able to create, and we'll bring up that Nginx pod just to have in front of us exactly what we're working with. So this pod still not be able to be created inside of the default namespace. So just as a sanity check, let's apply it one more time to the default namespace. We'll go back to our watch and we'll see once again, it is not able to be created. Great. So let's delete this deployment. All right. Now, Let's go ahead and create this deployment inside of the cube system namespace instead. Based on what we had set up, based on our pod security policies, we should have the ability to create it in cube system. So we will go ahead and switch our watch over to cube system for a moment. So watch, and in this case, cube system. Now note this will have a little bit more inside of it, but still nothing too crazy to follow. Let's go in and hop back. We'll create this once again, which is now in cube system. Oops, I ran delete that time. So we'll apply this in, come back to the watch. All right, and now if we follow it up, we should be able to see that this is be able to be created. So we can see the deployment at the bottom, Nginx host network deployment. We can see the replica set ID, the 597 number right here. And then we can see the instantiation of the pod for Z11S on the replica set 597C4C. So we now elevated privileges to the replica set controller inside of cube system and other controllers as well, which is fantastic, especially important if we were to kill something like core DNS or cube proxy. We wanna make sure that we have these elevated rights inside. So this actually gives you a really good idea of how pod security policies can be set up and how this flow can look. There is one more use case that I'm going to end with here. And that use case is what if we go back to the default namespace and in a hypothetical situation, we want to provide access to a specific service account. So what I'm getting at here is we still want the namespace to be completely locked down. But we want to make sure that one specific pod is able to run with some elevated privileges. We can do that. An interesting thing about PSP is you can actually provide access to use these pod security policies from the workloads service account so that when it starts, it can actually tell, oh, I'm allowed to do this and it goes ahead and stands up that particular pod. So to give an example of this, we're gonna go back to default here in a moment. All right. And inside of this setup, we're going to add a new role binding in. And this role binding is gonna be in the namespace for PSP permissive. And we're going to effectively say, if you are the special SA service account for the namespace default, you have the ability to resolve the PSP permissive, but anything else that gets started in here will not have access to do that. So the first thing that we need to do is we're going to need to create the service account special SA that you can see in this manifest. All right, now we're going to go ahead and apply this service account RBAC. So RBAC role binding service account permissive. We'll add that in. All right. Now, any particular deployment using the service account is going to have the ability to create one of these more privileged pods with host networking turned on. So let's go back to the deployment for host network. Let's add the service account into the spec for this pod. Now, again, this is inside of the replica set, inside of the pod spec. So we'll do service account, and we're going to provide it with the service account that you just saw, special SA, and save that. Now, again, we have no pods running in the default cube system, or not cube system, in the default default namespace, and we're going to apply this replica set and deployment one more time. So let's apply this deployment specifically for the host network-based Nginx and hit enter, and it's created. We'll go back to the watch. And boom, we've got the pod running because that particular service account has access to that more permissive pod security policy. Now, there are some other things that might be causing this to fail. So in particular, and why host networking is a dangerous thing, I completely forgot about the pod I had instantiated inside of the cube system namespace. So now this pod is contesting for that 
piece or that port, I should say, port 80. <laughs> so again, it does show, if we go back to the watch here, while it is failing to instantiate the pod, it's actually kind of making our case for pod security policies to some degree, which is that we really need to be able to limit this kind of stuff and make sure that we aren't just letting anybody hop on host networking or create any host port they want and so on. So now you can see how this is set up. Now, another interesting detail that I'd like to share with you, and we can still see it even though this pod isn't creating. In fact, to keep it cleaner, we could just go to the cube system namespace. So let's do the cube system namespace and let's look up the Nginx pod. All right, so here's our Nginx pod that did successfully grab that port. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna output the YAML of this pod. So we'll do a get one more time for this particular pod and we'll ask for the YAML output and that will be in the namespace of cube system. All right, now when troubleshooting, it can sometimes be helpful to figure out what pod security policy resolves. So if you have a lot of pod security policies, Kubernetes is just gonna find one that resolves and use it. And if you're trying to figure out why did this get allowed access and so on, you can figure that out by going into the annotations. When Kubernetes resolves, oops, when Kubernetes resolves that annotation, in this case, scrolling back up here, the PSP permissive annotation, that means it's the one that it found resolved and applied to this pod, and that is why it's running. So really cool tip and trick when you're debugging and figuring out what's going on in your system. Now, the last thing I wanna leave with is just one more note on the bootstrapping. So obviously it's unlikely you're gonna go into every single one of your clusters and do all the things that I just did manually. In fact, if you did them in the order I did, it'd be quite dangerous because you're kind of leaving your system in a fragile state. So what you really wanna think about doing when automating this, be it through Ansible or some other automation tool, is how do you put all of these bits in right out of the gate in an order that makes sense? So again, what you may wanna do is set up both inje injection of the policies up front, because even if pod security policy isn't turned on as an admission controller, Kubernetes still accepts those API objects. You may want to go in and create all your RBAC, all your roles, make sure everything is set up, and then use the alteration of that API server flag as kind of the on switch for pod security policies. Now, again, it all depends. Like if you're just bootstrapping clean, you might prefer to just set up the API server with pod security policies on and then have a job that sweeps all of these RBAC things and PSPs in right after the cluster gets instantiated. All different options. Just be considerate when you're going in and thinking about how exactly you should set up this automation and bootstrapping. So all in all, I hope you found this video helpful in setting up pod security policies and hopefully it'll save you a little bit of stress that I took on when I was first learning them as well. So thanks for watching. Again, the website that goes through this all in plain text is in the description of this video. Feel free to check it out and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.